Santa Barbara County District Attorney Tom Snedden had been trying to bring Michael Jackson to trial since the early 1990s after molestation allegations surfaced against the pop star. So where did the Snedden case go wrong? Well, it was a stunning victory for the defense. Michael Jackson not guilty on all 10 counts. Randy, let me show you some of the local papers. Uh, here's the Santa Barbara News Press, and it says, Jury's verdict on Jackson not guilty. On the left, it has each count underneath not guilty. On the right, it says, King of Pop is acquitted on all all counts. Justice is done, says his lawyer. Uh, the Santa Maria Times, another local paper. Here's the headline, Randy. Jury acquits Jackson, singer found not guilty of molestation and conspiracy. So after 14 weeks and 130 witnesses, the question is, Randy, what went wrong for the prosecution? Anything went wrong per se. Listen, when you're a prosecutor, well, I think some, you have Susan, to work come on, something. Uh, Susan, something definitely no. went wrong for the prosecution. Lisa, when you're a prosecutor, you deal with the facts that you have to work with. You don't make up the facts. What went wrong is the jury didn't believe the accuser and didn't believe the accuser's mother. But that's not the prosecution's fault. That's the witness that they had. The jury didn't believe them. Justice was served. That's what our system is all about. But my theory always was that the DA really shouldn't be bringing any cases that they think they can't win. Well, I'll tell you, I did the DA's job for 15 years. I tried well over 150 jury trials as a district attorney. The first thing in the criminal justice system that happens after the police make the arrest is the district attorney is presented with the paperwork, with the case, with the victim, and they at that time make a charging decision. If they don't think there's enough, they send their investigators out. In this case, Tom Steden did pick his victims because he could have rejected this case and said no. The victim or the alleged victim in this case, the accuser, the accuser's mother, the accuser's family are just not believable. I'm not going to charge this case. Snedden made the decision to charge this case. He brought it to trial. So to say he has to take victims as they come in is plain and simply not true. He made the charging decision in this case and it turned out to be a wrong one. But also, in fairness to him, keep in mind, at the end of this trial, there were pundits that were saying, oh, they're going to get a guilty on at least one or two of the counts. So we certainly convinced some of the people here in the public. He just didn't convince the people that counted, and that was the 12 jurors in this case. I don't necessarily think this jury said that nothing happened. What they said was proof beyond a reasonable doubt was not sustained. The prosecution didn't meet its burden. I don't think they said innocent or nothing happened. They said not guilty by the legal standard. The question is, should Tom Snedden have brought the conspiracy charge, which basically allowed the mother to go on the stand and talk to them? I don't know that he knew ahead of time just how bad a witness she would be. But remember, other jurors who were interviewed afterwards also said that they did believe that in the past, Michael Jackson had done things that he shouldn't have done. And correctly, they didn't hold that against him in this case. But what I'm trying to say is, I don't necessarily think this jury said this case shouldn't have been brought. It was stupid. It was a fair trial. But to say that it should right, have been brought or Snedden was on a personal vendetta, I just don't think you can go there. If yes. this... Uh, DA did not bring the conspiracy charges. Do you think that Michael Jackson would have been guilty on the child molestation charges? Well, I'll tell you what, they certainly would have had a better chance, but we're sitting here armchair quarterbacking that. Certainly the defense was able to get in a lot of evidence about the mother and about the accuser in this case and prove that they were plainly and simply bald-faced liars. So could they have? I don't think so. I think we would have ended up in the very same place. And what Susan said is, you know, well, nobody said he was innocent. And I couldn't agree with that more. But when the DA charges the case, they've got to look at it with, can we prove it beyond a reasonable doubt? And that's yeah. what they should have looked at in this case, plain and simple. Okay. Throughout the trial, a lot of people were questioning, will Michael Jackson actually survive this trial? Now we have the answer. Not only did he survive, but he is one free man.
So who was your pick for person of the day? The Michael Jackson fan who released 10 White Doves after his acquittal. Jackson's lead defense lawyer, Thomas Mesereau or Jackson's media coordinator for persuading the jury to speak with the media after the verdict came down. And 55% of you chose lead defense attorney Thomas Mesereau. He comes to us from Santa Maria, California. His very great victory there yesterday, a shutout victory. How did you get this case? I had known Randy Jackson for many years. Uh, initially, when the search of Neverland took place, uh, I did get a call about uh, flying to Las Vegas to meet Michael Jackson. Uh, I could not do it then. I was tied up in the Robert Blake case, getting ready for trial. And eventually, I had a falling out with Mr. Blake. And about three months after that, I uh, got another call to fly to Florida and meet Michael. You said that you were not surprised by the verdict. I was confident. I thought that we had uh, really destroyed their case very effectively on cross-examination, and I thought we had called a lot of very effective witnesses in our case. What kind of client was he? He's a wonderful client. He's one of the easiest clients to deal with that I've ever experienced. He's very kind. He's very gentle. He's very cooperative. He's a very, very honorable, decent person, and I thoroughly enjoyed representing him, and I consider him a friend. Was there any thought of him taking the stand? Yes, there was. When I gave my opening statement, I intended to put him on the stand, and he intended to testify. As the case developed, it became very clear to me that he didn't have to. We had shown the jury a videotape of a two-hour and 45-minute interview with Michael Jackson where he explained his life and his philosophy of music and living and his experiences growing up. And when we put all that together, we decided there was nothing really to be achieved by it. There were some who were saying the prosecution was obsessed with Michael Jackson. Do you share that view? Yes, I do. I share it completely. I think they were not objective about this case. They were not objective about their witnesses. They were not objective about the theories they tried to prove, which were unprovable because they were false. And I think their obsession really hurt them. Why did they make a mistake in going ahead with this? Well, they never thoroughly investigated the accusers and the accusers' family, in my opinion. And if you look at the early interviews with the accusers, you'll see the police basically accepting their story before they've even investigated who they are. It was really us that found all the problems with these witnesses, with their history, with their backgrounds. The prosecution almost turned a blind eye to what was really going on. How big a factor was Macaulay Culkin? He was a big factor. He was a wonderful witness for Michael Jackson. And I will always have tremendous respect for Macaulay Culkin. He's on top of the world. He didn't have to go to bat for his friend, and he did it anyway. And there never was any doubt that he was going to come and testify. He always said, I want to be there, I want to help Michael Jackson, and I want to tell the truth. He was a big factor, and he was a, a man of really strong character. We had one of the, we had the foreman on last night. We also had one of the jurors who said he believed that Michael Jackson was or is a pedophile. It's just that this prosecution didn't prove this case. How do you react to a statement like that? Well, I think he's wrong. Michael Jackson is not a pedophile. He's never been a pedophile. The prosecution has spent years trying to put together a story which they hoped they could prove and failed it to prove. So these were concocted stories? Well, certainly they were concocted by the main accusers, and, and certainly the prosecution tried to create the impression that other people were molested, and they all came in and said they weren't. If the jury can put themselves in your client's shoes, you win. How does someone put themselves in Michael Jackson's shoes? Well, first of all, Larry, this notion that he sleeps with boys was a concoction by the prosecution. What he said very openly was that he allows families into his room. Now, his room is the size of a duplex. It's two levels. He's had mothers sleep there, fathers sleep there, sisters sleep there, brothers sleep there. The prosecution concocted this little saying about sleeping with boys because they thought it would turn off the jury, and they failed. But yes, we did have to explain who Michael Jackson was to the jury, that he's a very creative spirit, a very gentle soul, a brilliant musician, a brilliant choreographer, and a very sensitive person who is very concerned about the world and the problems in the world. And he has a very childlike spirit and essence to him, and he attracts children all over the world. We did have to explain who he was, but this is a country which prides itself on diversity, on the freedom to be who you are, and we never diverted our attention from who Michael was. We never tried to make him look like anything but himself. He never tried to dress differently for the courtroom. Our whole intention was to show who Michael is and be proud of it and embrace it. What did he say to you when all ten counts were read? He said the word, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
His first reaction was gratitude. Gratitude to God, gratitude to his defense team, gratitude to his family and friends. Uh, that's really all he said. When your friend Mark Garagos was on this program last week, he was highly critical of pundits, television pundits, 24-hour news. Um, I okay. share Mark Garagos' comments. I think that uh, we have developed an industry of would-be experts who are not professional, who are not experienced, who are very amateurish in their comments about what's going on in courtrooms, and who are willing to give opinions when they're not even there. And I think it has become the theater of the absurd. And I think it reached its lowest level in this case. I knew a lot of what was going on when I would take a break in my apartment while I was preparing. I would turn on the TV set, and a lot of it was just appalling. The factual inaccuracies, um, the obvious bias uh, among people like Court TV, who I felt was really an arm of the prosecution through this case. How do you compress, you know, six to eight hours of testimony into a soundbite? You can't possibly be accurate. I frankly like freedom of the press, um, but it's reaching an absurd state when it comes to trials in America. We are obsessed with celebrity trials. The prosecutor, Mr. Snedden, said that there is celebrity justice, like in California. Blake is an example. This is an example. O.J., how do you react? Um, I'll tell you what celebrity injustice was in this case. It was sending 70 sheriffs to raid Michael Jackson's home in a search. It was putting more experts, more sheriffs, and more investigators on this case than they do with serial killers. Does. Michael Jackson was treated differently because he was a celebrity. Weren't you very concerned, though, when that tape was allowed in at the end? I was concerned, but after looking at it um, a second time and realizing how many conflicting statements this accuser had made in that interview, uh, the more I looked at it, the more I thought it would probably help us. And based on some of the jurors' comments, it did help us. Emotionally, is it hard to press when you cross-examine an accuser, a young accuser? Some young kids are, uh, have a level of maturity that's extremely high. And as Chris Tucker said about the accuser, he was very cunning and very smart. Uh, Michael's going to have to go through a period of physical recovery. Uh, he's exhausted. <clears throat> he was not sleeping. He was not eating. It was a very, very traumatic experience for him, and it's going to take him a while to recover. He's a very, very grateful, very spiritual person. Uh, I think he'd like to be left alone and would like to heal and mend and move forward. I think he can recover because Michael is a very resilient person. And yes, he's been a target for many years. He's been maligned. He's been scandalized. But he's also one of the world's greatest artists and one of the world's greatest talents and also one of the world's greatest humanitarians. And Michael has all the tools and the skills and the support to recover and go forward and do very well. He's a creative soul. You can stifle his creativity. And I would not be surprised if he makes a rebound. Was the family easy to deal with? The family was lovely to deal with. They're very, very wonderful people. They were all very supportive of Michael. There were a lot of rumors about dissension that were not true. They were a joy to deal with. You have said that Michael was the victim of bad advice in the past. Are you saying he shouldn't have settled anything? That's correct. But I think if Michael could go back, he would never have settled those cases. He would have fought them to the end, and the message would have got out, don't make false claims against Michael Jackson or you're going to trial. I think that he was treated in a way that no one else would have been similarly treated. It was because he was a mega, mega celebrity. You had a tragedy happen to you during this trial. Your sister died of lung cancer, right? Was Michael compassionate about that death? Michael was not only compassionate, uh, he sent her the most beautiful the largest bouquet of flowers you've ever seen. He wrote a little poem for her. Uh, it came from he and his children, and it was one of the most meaningful, most wonderful things that he could have done for her during her final days. How does he interact with his kids? Beautifully. He loves his children. They love him. He spends a lot of time with them. Um, he's a loving, doting, caring father. Are they well-mannered? Yes, they are. And was that hard? When you have to ask your own client, did you do this to this boy? Uh, frankly, no, because the more I got to know Michael Jackson and the more ridiculous I realized these charges were and the more of a gentle, charitable, kind-hearted, decent person he is, um, the less difficulty there was. And the Michael Jackson that I know doesn't even come close to the Michael Jackson they tried to portray. If you look at the few interviews he's done, you see a very, very simple, down-to-earth person. 
who is very honest about who he is, honest about his loneliness, honest about his childhood. He's a very, very decent, kind person and easy to deal with. And trusting. Too trusting. That's been his, his, his downfall. He has trusted the wrong people. He has felt sorry for the wrong people. He has tried to heal the wrong people. And they've turned on him and tried to take advantage of him through the legal system. This was a horrible experience for him, and he's not going to allow people to just run wild through his home. He has to get much firmer, and he will. Uh, so therefore, you didn't deal with you telling him how to act in court. You know, jurors are smart. They're intuitive. They're instinctive. They know what they're being asked to do to somebody at the uh, council table. And you don't want to have your client do something that's phony or unrealistic. I wanted Michael Jackson to be exactly who he was and is and be proud of it. And that's what he did. There was nothing phony about our side of the table. There was a lot that was phony about the prosecution side of the table. Meaning they knew they were doing something that wasn't right. I don't see how they could not have known that. Look at their conspiracy theory, for example. It was the most ridiculous theory I've ever heard of. I don't know how they did it with a straight face. up that Martin Bashir program and how, how, how did you feel about it? I saw you on TV talking about yeah. it. Well I felt uh, uh, well I felt betrayed. Has it made life difficult for you and Michael? I mean has it has it spoiled your relationship with Michael? I think so. I do think so.